Welcome to the second part of this lecture on circadian rhythms. This part will be about different models of circadian rhythms. My name is Bjørn Olav Hall and I'm from the University of Copenhagen. As noted in the last part of the lecture, circadian rhythms does not relate to a single biological phenomena, rather it relates to a series of biological objects that interacts with one another. To that end, it is possible to develop or create uh, models that focus on different aspects of the circadian rhythms. For instance, we can focus on the core oscillator of a single neuron, or we could focus on how these neurons in the superchiasmatic nucleus are synchronized or we could focus on how the superchiasmatic nucleus uh, sort of entrains um, a, a circadian rhythm that drives a, a physiological function. In this part of the talk, we will focus on a core oscillator models of uh, the core oscillator. First, I would like to show you a simplified schematic of the mechanism of the core oscillator in human beings. The aspects that are left out of this mechanism here promotes robustness uh, to the oscillations. Moreover, variations between cells give rise to different levels of expressions of protein, which again gives rise to slightly different frequencies of oscillations, and it, that explains why you have frequency distribution among individual cells. I will briefly try to take you through this mechanism. First, transcription and translation of the BML1 and the clock genes give rise to a protein dimer that co-activates the per and cry genes. These genes are also activated by light, so a per cry dimer increases during daytime. Next, expression of an orphan gene called REP-alpha inhibits the expression of the BML1 and the clock genes. Finally, the per cry protein dimer also inhibits its own transcription, but also the transcription of the orphan REP-alpha gene. As you can see, by setting the timings correctly, this can sort of intuitively lead to a situation where you see oscillations in the expression of the BML1 clock protein dimer, but also the per cry protein dimer. For the sake of simplicity, we will focus here on the core circadian oscillator model in a fungus called Neurospora and this model has been taken from a paper called Theoretical Models for Circadian Rhythms in Neurospora and Drosophila. The Neurospora model consists of a set of three ordinary differential equations where the m is a, a variable describing the mRNA of the FRQ protein in the nucleus or cytosol the FC variable describes the FRQ concentration in the cytosol and the FN variable describes the FRQ concentration in the nucleus. And we have used the following set of initial conditions in simulations that follow. To the right here you can see a schematic of the model and in red, green and blue I have encircled the variables and down below here you can see the parameter set that describes the model and the values of the parameters and a description of the parameters. I won't go into de detail due to the consideration of time. In the following we will walk through the different elements of the three ordinary differential equations. First in red here you see an equation describing the transcription of the FRQ gene, but also the negative 
feedback provided by the nuclear FRQ protein. So you can see sort of a hill type equation where the rate of, um, of uh, FRQ transcription is inhibited by the level of uh, FN protein present. Whereas the first term here described the production of mRNA, the second term here describes the degradation of mRNA because you have the minus in front of this equation. And as you can see, this is a michaelis menten equation that describes a saturation of, um, of degradation of mRNA. Next, we have a linear production of the FC protein that just depends on the, uh, on the amount of mRNA present in the cytosol. Degradation of the FC protein is determined by this michaelis menten equation. Finally, you have a transport reaction. So in summary, you can see that this production term of mRNA is very important in order to achieve oscillations because during buildup of the mRNA you will eventually get an increased concentration of the FRQ protein. When this buildup of FRQ protein is high enough, you inhibit further transcription of the FRQ gene leading to less production of the mRNA and less production of the FRQ protein. When you, when you then have low enough FRQ protein, the transcription of the FRQ uh, gene can recommence. And this will lead to a, uh, to a cycle or an oscillation uh, where this negative feedback is very, very critical. Now we can try to apply an external forcing of this circadian oscillator. As we saw before, the production of mRNA is influenced by light. And as the parameter Vs determines the rate of production of mRNA, we can try to, to manipulate uh, this parameter value. Under constant conditions, the Vs parameter is set to 1.6 nanomolar per hour. And then you get oscillations as shown here in A. If you calculate the period between oscillations, you'll end up with a value of 21.5 hours. But if you now apply light-dark conditions, where Vs is set to 1.6 during night and 2 during day, you can see that you entrain your oscillations to follow a 24-hour period. The figures obtained without and with entrainment of the Vs parameter fits very well with the figures shown in the paper, as you can see here. In summary, we have shown that by forcing a parameter to an external oscillator, in this case the diurnal rhythm, we may entrain the intrinsic oscillator, in this case the circadian rhythm in neur neurospora. However, <clears throat> also if you had two individual oscillators, they may also entrain to one another, and this process we call synchronization. And this is what is what is occurring when the master clock is synchronizing all the peripheral clocks in our body. Finally, computational modeling allows us to investigate these synchronization processes. The take home messages for this part of the lecture are the following. First, we saw that the core oscillator mechanisms 
of uh, circadian rhythms can differ between organisms. Next, we saw that nonlinearity is necessary in order for oscillations to occur. And finally, we saw that oscillators can be forced uh, to an external oscillator, and in fact, oscillators can both synchronize to one another, but they can also be in a desynchronized state. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the professional and technical assistance from Olga Sosnovtseva from the Department of Biomedical Sciences here at the University of Copenhagen. Thank you.